So this is pretty eventful of what's taken place uh, this week. I don't know if you've had opportunity to watch uh, television, whether it's been the quote-unquote regular TV shows, right? Uh, uh, ABC, CBS, NBC, uh, PBS, all that kind of stuff. Or, or maybe you even had uh, cable or satellite. Maybe you've seen the specials on already, but something special took place 50 years ago. In fact, the date was July 16th, where Apollo 11 was sent off into space, and man was uh, in his quest to land on the moon 50 years ago. Now, I've got to tell you, I wasn't alive at that time, but I am closing in on that date very closely, very quickly. So here's the deal. I get the history report. I get to understand it. I get to see all these videos. I get to see um, this just incredible this phenomenal, this amazing event that happened. In fact, I had the great opportunity to grow up in Houston where the Johnson Space Center is. And we would go there for field trips. We'd go there for family vacations. And I get to take a look at the Saturn V rocket that helped put man on the moon. It is amazing. It stands 363 feet tall a full length of a football field, and plus the end zones. It's amazing. And you should see how each big rocket is so, I call it gargantuan. It's just amazing. And one would think that it has to be because it has to lift up 3,100 tons. That is just amazing. The big stages of the different rockets, and finally the little capsule where the men sat at the top, And I know for you car enthusiasts, you you know how obviously that it is recorded for cars, right? For speed. You do zero to 60 in whatever, two, three, four, five seconds, however fast your car is. Or if it's not fast, 10, 12, 11, you know, whatever it is. But in rockets, you have to do something different. In rockets, you have to change it just a little bit, and you have to say from zero to 42 miles above the earth in two minutes and 47 seconds. 42 miles in 2 minutes and 42 seconds. That is incredible. It is phenomenal. It is amazing. And of course, people were just amazed not only then, but they're amazed now that this actually took place. It's just fantastic. Well, if you thought that was awesome, guess what we're going to talk about today? God's power. I hope you're holding on to your seats. I hope you're ready for it, because here it comes. See, today in Genesis, as we see some things, oftentimes we will overlook some of the amazing things that took place, even when we hear it, when we read it. Yeah, we've heard the story before. But when you take time and start to dissect and start to look at what has actually really taken place, I hope you're as amazed as I am. Because in chapter 18 of Genesis, we know that the Lord himself comes to appear to Abraham. Abraham is sitting underneath the trees, and he's sitting out there. It's hot, and these three visitors come by. And in your text, if you haven't seen it before, the Lord is capitalized, and that usually denotes that it's Yahweh. It's God himself. God is there with two angels, and they're waiting outside. They're waiting kind of at a distance. Abraham sees him, and as customary, he goes and welcomes him. He says, please, come and stop by. Rest a bit. Take some time. I can get you some food. Come and sit here. Abraham didn't recognize who it was. God is there in in some human shape or form. He's standing before them with two angels which he did not recognize. They look like all men, and and he has them come in, and they agree to sit there. And right away, he goes to Sarah, and he says, come on, get the bread going. Knead it, make it, bake it, get it ready. We've got guests. And he himself runs out to go get the calf, a choice calf, right? We're, We're back to beef again. Here we go. And he gets that beef, and, 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 and the other person, uh, his, his servant, prepares it for him. And they get it all ready, and they, they do it with haste. He brings him milk and curds and, and all these things to help satisfy these guests. 
And as they sit down, it would have been interesting to see Abraham's face. For the Lord himself says, where is Sarah? See, God knows exactly who he's dealing with. He's dealing with his people. And he calls her by name. And what's very interesting about this, he knew the, the new name. The one actually that had been given because that had just happened a, f a few moments, well, times earlier really, where instead of Abram and Sarai, the names had been changed because of the new covenant. He called them and he said, Abraham, you are going to be the father of many nations. Well, how can this be? We, we don't have children. I know. And God says, I'm making the new covenant with you through the circumcision. I'm saying that you are now going to be Abraham. You are now going to be Sarah. And you will carry out my plan. You will carry out what I'm going to do for you. I know who you are. And so God loves his people. He keeps his promises also. If you didn't notice this before, he keeps his promise by speaking with Abraham and he tells them, really him, because Sarah's outside of the tent. She's behind him somewhere. He doesn't see that she's there. Abraham makes the, or uh, sorry, the Lord makes a comment to Abraham and says, by this time next year, you will have a child. And not just a child, but you will have a son. Because remember, Abraham, Sarah, they took things in their own hands and they tried to figure out the way of God's doing and, and they said, why don't you go ahead and take the, the servant, Hagar, and then you have Ishmael and then you will have all of this and we'll take care of it and, and that's the way God must be doing it. And God says, no. No, I, I've got the plan. I've got the way that I'm going to take care of all of you. And this is what I'm going to do. This time next year, you will have a son. He didn't say, mark my words, but God doesn't have to. His word is as good as anything in this entire world that you will ever experience. This time next year, you will have a son. son. And what happens? Sarah's behind the tent, and, and she's hearing the stuff, and, and she laughs to herself. I'm beyond childbearing years. My husband is old. That time is past. And now I'm going to get to enjoy this now as an older person. The Lord says then to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? We don't know that he actually audibly heard it, but God knows. He knows all. He knows everything. And we're talking about the almighty power of God. And here he is showing his relationship with his creation. With the people that he formed, that he knit in the wombs of the parents. His relationship is one of love and it comes beaming through in just these short verses in chapter 18. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to guess that you're probably like me. The idea that sometimes there are times when we have trouble believing what the Almighty can do. Or maybe worse, Maybe worse, we even attribute God's handiwork to random chance or by man's power. Don't get me wrong, there's many, many intelligent people, men and, men and women that worked on that rocket that got us to the moon. But today as we gather together, and isn't it, isn't it more important to really worship the one who actually created the earth and the moon. I'm telling you, I hope that you have your seatbelts fastened. Because God's almighty power, there's nothing difficult, there's nothing too hard for him. Because that's what he tells Abraham. He tells his people, this is my plan, this is what I'm doing. But we often, we often have trouble believing what the almighty can do. Think about this. We believe 
oftentimes too, when it comes out our way, when it works for us, oh, God is right there with us. We believe firmly and we're rolling and everything's going good. But what happens when it doesn't work out the way that we want things to? Do we really believe then that God is almighty? Can he do those things? Do we laugh like Sarah? Or sometimes do we cry to God, where are you? Or sometimes do we scream out to him and say, if you're really there, show yourself. Well, today, God has a plan. And it's an incredible plan, and he has it not only for the people of that time, but also for you and those yet to come. Here's something that might help to explain and help you to understand even more. See, in 1972, a number of years obviously after that uh, Apollo 11 mission, um, NASA sent up a probe in space. It was called the Pioneer 10. And it went, or its mission is to go to Jupiter take uh, photographs of it. Uh, it's supposed to be able to uh, measure the magnetic field. It was going to detect all the radiation to see what the levels were and then also kind of go through the atmosphere. And it's supposed to do all of this. They had it all figured out of what they were going to do. Nothing had at that time had been even past Mars. And so this was a big endeavor. And so what did scientists do? They created this probe. And from 1972 to finally November 1973, Pioneer 10 did its job. It did all the things. It sent back the information. But there was one more bonus round that happened. It continued to keep on going. Now, I didn't read up on it enough to, to see if it was like programmed to do that or it just shot out on its own or they did something or whatever else, but the gravitational force has sent it on again to the next planet. And as it continued on one billion miles, it passed Saturn. And roughly around two billion miles, it passed Uranus, Past three billion miles, it passed Neptune. And somewhere nearly around four billion miles, it got out there to, I don't even know what it's today, Pluto. Is it a planet? Is it a dwarf? Is it, I don't know what it is. They keep changing it. But finally, after 25 years and six billion miles out, still going, Pioneer 10 was still working. Pioneer 10 was remarkably still sending back signals off of an 8-watt transmitter. Now, again, at the time of this article that was written, that equates to about the power that you need to run a bedroom nightlight. This thing is going on for 25 years, and do you know the interesting part about this? The scientists, those that created this thing, it was designed to know that it would hopefully last around three years, they knew that it was going to fail. <laughs> Little did they know. 25 years later and some six billion miles, it kept on going. It was a surprise to them of what actually still worked. It didn't get destroyed by an asteroid. It didn't burn up in a planet. It kept on going. And it sent back radio signals. And from wherever it was, it took nine hours to travel all the way back to Earth. Here's where our story changes for us. See, God had designed us not to fail. God had designed our first parents, Adam and Eve, to say, this is my perfect creation. It's the ultimate. I'm making it in them in man's image, or in God's image, sorry. In God's image, I'm creating male and female. Perfect creation to finish off the six days of creation. First three days, habitat. The next three days, then, everything that goes inside and lives in the habitat. A God of order, a God of design. But our first parents messed up, didn't they? They entered in sin, and they brought it to themselves. And today, we still continue in our sin and suffering, don't we? Things aren't the way that they're supposed to be. However, our God is steadfast. Our God continues to love his people, you and me. He loves his creation, and it's by his almighty power that he sustains us. 
that he keeps us going. The words incredible, remarkable, phenomenal, amazing, awesome, whatever comes to mind, very much fit at this time. Because our God, loving his people, loving his creation, by his power, you know what he does, don't you? He decides to send a son. Except this is no, like no any other son that there ever is, was, or will be. This is his one and only son. God the Father sent Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, to be our Savior. And he said this one is going to be sent for all generations in all the world. And it's so important to know who he is. Because incredibly, phenomenally, amazingly, Jesus enters into our world. And he lives a perfect life. He heals the troubled. He heals the sick. He restores sight to the blind. He even raises people from the dead. But you ain't seen nothing yet. Our God in his infinite wisdom and in his infinite power, Jesus takes his life and he sacrifices. He suffers and he dies on the cross for you, for me, for all people. But that's not the end. Take a look at this picture up here. I hope you can tell this perspective because you see on that cross that it's an empty cross. But do you see where the vision is coming from? Do you see where the look and the gaze upon the empty cross is from? It's the tomb that has been rolled away. You see, 50 years ago, one of our astronauts, Neil Armstrong, he stepped on the moon and he said those famous words, and I know there's some, some question about what he exactly said, but it fits so well today. He said one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And I'm here to say, by God's word, when Jesus took that step outside of that tomb, that first step on that land, not only was it a step for mankind, it's the greatest step that ever was, ever is, or ever will be. It's the one step that changed the entire course of history for all time. The gift of eternal life has been given because of what Jesus Christ has done. Yeah, words come to mind such as incredible, such as phenomenal, such as amazing, because that's the love of our Father that he has for his creation. That's the love that he has for people because Jesus came to pay for our sins. Death no longer has a hold on us. And the devil certainly cannot grasp at us. Although he may try, he has no power over us. Incredible, phenomenal, amazing. Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.